Welcome back everybody uh, to Software Engineering 1. This is going to be the, uh, the only lecture uh, in this module actually about systems analysis. So um, just to kind of recap, um, this is a shorter week uh, because of the holiday um, than most of the other modules. Um, and this lecture doesn't really lend itself nicely to being split up um, like a lot of the other ones do. Um, so this is probably going to be a little bit longer um, than some of the other lectures, uh, so kind of bear with me here. But we're going to go through um, the entire kind of theoretical background of what systems analysis is uh, in preparation for um, architecture and design, uh, which are much, uh, I think, more fun uh, pieces to the puzzle uh, that we'll start talking about next week. So to kind of put it in uh, context of what we talked about last time, um, we were really focused uh, last week on three main questions. First, um, what are requirements? Second, why are they important to us? And third, um, how do we actually go about getting these things? Um, why, why are they relevant? Um, I'm going to move myself up. <clears throat> So um, in this model, what we're going to do is we're going to take um, all of those uh, requirements that we previously really focused on um, the gathering and distill those into some sort of project specification that we can take back to a client and actually have uh, some sort of binding agreement um, between the client uh, and the software vendor that the, you and I and software engineers work for. Um, that effectively lays out all of the expectations that the client has for delivery, so exactly what they can expect in the, the software system that you're building for them, and what you, the software engineer, or the architect, or the project manager, can uh, expect in terms of the workload, um, so uh, the timeline, and things like that. So um, it's useful to think of all of these uh, kind of steps in the process as uh, input-output pairs. And so we've done this uh, in the past. And so the input here um, would be functional and non-functional requirements, both high and low level, um, that we previously generated uh, through uh, eliciting requirements and requirements gathering. Uh, the output is going to be an actual physical document um, that you can take uh, to the client um, and the two parties, so the business team and the technical team, can both kind of agree about the concrete meaning um, of the, the project. So exactly what's going to happen, how is it going to happen, um, that, that sort of thing. So this project documentation, um, or this uh, specifications document, is extremely similar um, to what you will be preparing for the course project. Um, so the project proposal is very, very similar to this. Um, so if you um, look at sort of software organization in general, and we're going to do this later in the semester, um, there are really two ways that this can kind of happen. Um, either um, a huge company sends out um, a request for RFPs or for proposals, and in that request, they give you a whole bunch of requirements, and you have to use the, um, those requirements to build a proposal. Um, or you kind of sit down uh, and mutually arrive at this documentation through a kind of formal elicitation of requirements like we've been talking about. Um, so in the case of the course project, it's much more the RFP style thing. Um, so I have asked you to prepare a proposal. Um, you prepare the proposal and you submit it. We don't necessarily sit down and talk about uh, requirements beforehand. Those are kind of implicit or they've been sent to you um, as part of the, uh, part of the uh, uh, proposal, a call for proposals. That, that's a good way to put it. So um, in either of those cases, the point is that um, this is really where um, both sides of the table, so business and technical team, um, can agree with minimal uh, ambiguity, minimal uh, disagreement about what is going to be the end result of the project. Um, and so exactly like your project proposal, if there's a lot of ambiguity, um, the grader will tell you about the ambiguity, um, and if there is a lot of ambiguity, you um, and your teammates kind of maybe need to go back to the drawing board and maybe uh, tighten up some requirements to make sure that you're all on the same page of what you plan on producing. So 
Um, one note um, about the textbook. Um, so um, I, I usually, uh, I, I don't know, the, the textbook is something, it, it is sort of is what it is. Um, the text is a much better resource um, reference manual than it is um, like a, a thing to use to learn software engineering. Um, it's extremely vocabulary heavy. Um, and it does a lot of what I call hand wringing around kind of esoteric things. Um, so um, they go through quite a bit of um, this is called the specifications document if these six requirements are met and all this kind of stuff. And so what I'm actually referring to as a specification document is a, the general idea of a, spe a specification document. So um, this is something that allows a technical team and a business team to agree um, with each other about what a project is um, with minimal ambiguity. That's what I mean. Um, I, I'm not kind of using uh, legal terminology or something like that, uh, more specific. Um, so going back uh, to something that we talked about um, last week, uh, specifically institutional and domain knowledge. Um, institutional domain knowledge um, give uh, the business team uh, sort of the, the edge in understanding what the project is actually supposed to be doing. Um, and if you think about uh, the software team, there will also be people who are very, very good at databases. There will be people who are very, very good at UI, so on and so forth. And so usually um, these people on either the, the technical side or the business side are known as subject matter expertise, uh, or experts or SMEs. Um, and the idea um, for any project team is to have as many SMEs in as many different areas as physically possible. Um, if you have multiple SMEs in the same area, then obviously they may have a different uh, sort of perspective on things that is helpful. Um, but if you could replace a duplicative SME with a SME in a completely different area, um, then obviously you're going to, um, to have a lot uh, better time trying to build uh, various components of the system. Um, these guys are extremely critical um, for um, the process of designing uh, or um, building a, a project specification uh, because they're the people with the deepest knowledge of either the business process that you're trying to actually uh, mimic or support um, or the technology that you're trying to use to support that critical business function. Um, so if you are missing information on either side of that situation, um, either you're going to fundamentally miss the mark uh, and not have the technology that you need or misuse the technology that you have to do something that it would otherwise support, or you're going to be missing functionality. Um, so um, uh, missing uh, subject matter expertise on the business side is in some ways um, less uh, bad than uh, having a lack of SMEs on the technical side because you can't necessarily teach um, a person uh, how an entire database stack works um, mid-project. Um, but you can go through and kind of look at the existing system and try to divine uh, some institutional knowledge that may not exist um, on the, the business team. So um, the way that I like to um, kind of explain analysis um, is looking at the teams that we used uh, to kind of figure out what the requirements are for the system. Um, and what this really becomes um, is like a bridge between the two of them. Um, and so uh, at the very beginning, what you have is this maybe giant stack of requirements and the requirements can range from extremely technical things that the business team has no idea what they mean um, all the way to extremely business uh, process laden things that the technical team doesn't necessarily understand uh, specific banking pra practices and things like that so what analysis does is it kind of brings all of those requirements to the middle um, by producing documentation that fills in the gaps so uh, things that you have to deal with are the fact that um, both teams are going to have their own jargon. Um, so you're going to have to kind of uh, bridge the gap between terminology. And we've kind of talked about that before um, using vocabulary or uh, dictionaries and that kind of thing. Um, they're also going to have best practices. Um, and if you use the literal term best practices, 
Um, sometimes you'll get really lost in meetings uh, because you'll be talking about banking best practices, which are not necessarily the same as implementing uh, or best practices for implementing a banking system. Um, and they also have their own sets of known issues. Um, so if you're in a meeting and you're talking about a really, really complicated business task, um, you could um, have people on the technical team that are also aware of known issues around a technology that you're thinking about using to implement that very complicated business task. Um, and so that would be a, a fairly high risk situation where you're trying to use a kind of cutting edge or uh, technology with known issues uh, to support a really convoluted uh, business process also with known issues. Um, if we drill down into this a little bit more, um, if you take all of the jargon and the best practices and the known issues on the business team side, that stuff is actually really the requirements. Um, so that's what the system should do at the end of the day. These are non-functional requirements, functional requirements. They're the, the system when you sum it all up. And so that's also kind of the, the scope of the project. Um, on the uh, software, the technical side, what you have is the capabilities of the software team. Um, so uh, if one of the requirements is that um, you have to have satellite telemetry to do um, some component of the business process and you don't have a person who has GIS experience or you, somebody that has experience using satellite data, um, then you're obviously going to have a requirement that doesn't have a covering capability. Um, and those are risks to the project that you want to analyze uh, and identify very, very early um, because if this is a two-year project and you know that you don't necessarily need the ability to process that data until year two, um, then you can always fill that capability um, or you can go and you can find uh, some existing system to potentially integrate with um, that will cover that capability without actually having to go out and find a person who can do, uh, do the work specifically. Um, so uh, left hand side gives you all the requirements that's very um, similar to what we talked about last week. And on the right hand side gives you all the stuff that you can actually do as a software team. And so if you don't have the capability of doing something that the requirements specify that you need to do, clearly that's a problem uh, and clearly that's a risk to the project you need to identify. So um, when you're talking about requirements gathering, uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get this very kind of uh, fine grained uh, building block perspective of what the system is actually trying to do. Um, what systems analysis does is it takes all of those requirements and it actually builds something tangible out of them that is useful to everyone. Um, so like we were saying before, um, requirements are great if you understand the requirement. If the requirement makes no sense and you don't have a context for how the requirement fits into the system, um, you can meet the requirement all day, um, but potentially that requirement is not going to be met in a way that a reasonable user is going to be able to utilize the system. And at that point, you haven't actually accomplished anything. You checked a box and yes, the requirement is fulfilled, but it isn't fulfilled in a meaningful kind of way. And so um, if we go all the way back to our construction uh, kind of metaphor, you can think of requirements as basically the bricks that you're trying to use to build something. Um, and the specifications would be the blueprint um, of the thing that you're trying to build. Uh, so we're taking all of the, the sort of uh, bricks and we're saying, if I line up all of these bricks, uh, I can build the left wall over here and the right wall over here, and I can uh, shim in plumbing wherever I need to. Um, and so we're taking something that uh, if you sum it all up, it gives you the project scope. Um, and turning that into something much more structured um, that tells you exactly how all of those pieces fit together. So um, specification documents are one of those things that kind of exist on a continuum. Um, and so one of the things that uh, the, the textbook does a really good job of is going through um, several different uh, case studies that kind of show you um, how technical some of these uh, specification documents can be. Um, these things uh, range from essentially just requirements that are hammered into something like JIRA um, all the way to uh, thousand page documents um, that have extremely detailed uh, use cases and storyboards and all sorts of stuff for every individual uh, kind of use case in the system. 
Um, so what you want is you want neither of those situations uh, in general. What you want is you want something that provides enough uh, context around requirements that a reasonable kind of uh, informed reader would understand um, A, how the process actually works, how they would use the system, and B, how they could potentially build an architectural design around that use case or around that feature um, to actually make it happen, uh, to write some code that actually uh, make it implements that, uh, that functionality. So the main thing that you want is you want to codify the relationships between requirements. Um, so you want to show them um, how, or you want to show the reader of the specification document how things hang together. And this is a, a phrase that is used all over the place um, in architectural literature. Um, and basically it's uh, indicating that the specification document in a lot of ways fills in the interstitial space between uh, requirements, um, where if you don't have a really good understanding of context, you're going to almost assuredly fail um, but the specification document is supposed to sure up um, all of that uncertainty. So um, an absolutely integral part um, of systems analysis is diagramming relationships. Um, so you can see these in use case diagrams and class diagrams and all sorts of diagrams. Um, and in iteration one um, of your project uh, or your group project, you're going to have to build some of these, uh, these diagrams. Um, and so starting next week, uh, we're going to have uh, recitation uh, videos that are in addition to uh, the videos that I usually uh, record throughout the week. Um, and so one of those uh, recitations for next week is going to go through the process of actually building um, a use case diagram and building a class diagram uh, and kind of show you the high points um, so that you're prepared for doing that for your, uh, for your group project. Um, but suffice it to say um, that diagrams are one major way that you can actually codify relationships between things and they're visual um, and that makes them very, very useful for trying to clear up ambiguity like we said uh, at the end of last week. So um, in the wide world of uh, systems analysis, there's really two kinds. Um, there is a little bit of a... Uh, a bias here. Uh, cla classical analysis is more of a, an older kind of thing. Um, it does not require object orientation and really what it's about is it's about data manipulation. So um, where does data come from? How does data change? And where does data go to um, is, is really um, what everything's about. Then we have object-oriented analysis, um, which basically mirrors um, object-oriented design or object-oriented programming. Um, and the idea here is we can leverage um, newer um, features of languages or newer ideas in uh, software design um, to mirror uh, the business process with the actual technical implementation that we're building. So if we can literally create um, a, an account class that looks and feels and walks and talks like a bank account, um, then the people who are on the engineering team who understand how the account class works uh, will be speaking the same native language that the people on the business team are talking about when they talk about bank accounts. Um, so methods will give you behavior, um, data members like fields or properties will give you um, all of the state. Um, and so you don't have to have a lot of documentation to get language uh, the same to be the same um, because you're already uh, kind of doing that implicitly through the structure of the system. Um, so the one thing that I want to do um, this semester that I didn't do a very good job of last time um, is provide a warning about classical analysis uh, versus object-oriented analysis. Um, and that is that this seems extremely dichotomous. Um, and in a lot of cases, people uh, toward the end of the semester, particularly in their debrief for the, program, uh, for the group assignment, um, said that they wish that they would have gone back and done something like classical analysis because they kind of leaned heavily on an object-oriented um, approach to design in their uh, uh, specifications document and ultimately that design changed. 
And so if you are predicating your specifications on a design and the design changes, then clearly everything downstream of that also changes. Um, so if you choose object-oriented uh, analysis, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't also have some components um, of classical analysis. You can kind of uh, pick and choose. You can have um, whichever one sort of uh, works best for you. Um, this mirrors very similarly um, our discussion about Scrum and Kanban. Um, there's nothing that says that if you have some aspects of one, you can't have other aspects of the other. Um, and it's really, at the end of the day, not super important that you can uh, categorize exactly what uh, something is called. It's much more important that you're actually doing the work. Um, so if you are actually putting work into performing analysis and being intentional um, about the design of a system and actually communicating that design to the, uh, to the stakeholders on the business team, then you are uh, light years ahead of if you did not do that. Um, so even if you're using something in between classical analysis and object-oriented analysis, that's totally fine. Um, the point is that you're using some form of analysis and that is better than no form of analysis. So um, everything in classical analysis is predicated on what is called data flow. Uh, so data flow has three primary components um, and it is basically uh, past, present, future is the way that I kind of think about it. Um, so the, uh, the past is kind of where the data actually originated from. Uh, so this can be something like uh, a database file. Uh, it can be uh, a file upload. It could be a user typing stuff in their, their keyboard, whatever. Um, and all of that information goes into what are called data manipulators. So these are things that uh, transform data. They do aggregations by averaging values. They do um, uh, validation, verification, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of the, the middle part. Um, and then ultimately, all of that manipulated data goes into some sort of long-term storage. So um, that is not to say that a uh, data source couldn't go through a, a manipulator that becomes a, an additional source for another manipulator that ultimately ends in data store. Um, these are basically just the three uh, components. Um, and you can see them arranged in whatever uh, organization you, you want. And so there is a case study um, in the text. Um, if you're interested, it's in chapter uh, 12. Um, and it will go through a fairly large um, data flow diagram. Uh, and you can kind of get a feel uh, for how these things kind of fit together. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they kind of look like this, right? So you have a data source on the left. You have something that manipulates that data. You have a data store on the right. And in the middle here, um, you can have any, any, any number of data manipulators or data sources uh, that you want that do additional manipulation um, and ultimately write things into some sort of deep storage. So um, at the top, we have what's commonly referred to as the right path. Um, so um, this is uh, taking data potentially from, uh, from a user and then putting that into something, potentially a database or something like that. And then at the bottom, we have the read path. And so the read path is taking something from the database or from some deep storage and then passing that back to, uh, to the user. So, um, these are kind of the, the abstract. If we try to make these more concrete, this could be a user. This is some kind of controller, some business logic. Um, and then this could be a SQL database or a NoSQL database. It's just some, uh, some place that you're actually storing records. So um, if you look at the data flow, flow um, diagram for an actual production system, these things are often extremely large. Um, so you don't necessarily only have one uh, user, you could have potentially multiple users, you could have many uh, different uh, data manipulation schemes that feed into multiple different uh, data stores. Um, and in uh, most production uh, diagrams, you don't just have one data store, you would have uh, a data store that represents a table in a database. Um, so you could have potentially hundreds of data stores depending on how many tables you have in the database. And so uh, one of the things that's really important is to take that huge data flow diagram and kind of break it up uh, into components. 
and each of these components ultimately uh, maps to what are called architectural units, which we will talk about um, next week um, in, in some pretty greedy detail. Um, so the idea is that you would be able to take something fairly complicated, fairly high level, um, and then bite those off uh, piece by piece in, in much more manageable uh, components. And so um, even though um, the idea uh, for classical analysis is really kind of rooted in um, older uh, kind of water flow, uh, um, waterfall methodologies, um, you can also uh, see that there is still some agile um, aspects to it, right? So if you can take uh, something very, very large, you can break it into much uh, smaller units and then kind of iteratively uh, refine those components um, asynchronously uh, uh, with respect to each other. Um, one part about these data flow diagrams um, is that these uh, data flow diagrams are not just the uh, computer system. These things are the actual business process. And so these could contain things like um, a person taking money from the vault of a bank and then physically uh, moving that money from the vault to a different vault or to a different branch of the bank or God knows what. And so one of the most critical um, aspects of mapping out a data flow diagram for a classical system um, is knowing which components need to be computerized and which uh, components cannot be computerized. And then in the middle, uh, what you have or things that could be prioritized, but it's obviously going to take some money to do so. And so what you want to do is provide the business team with a sort of prioritized list um, and then use that prioritized list and the budget that's been agreed to um, so that you can kind of understand um, what the impacts of trying to computerize everything is compared to computerizing only the bare minimum. Um, and so this is um, this sort of budgeting idea, is something that's going to come back up in uh, the module about organization. Um, but uh, this is something really, really important to think about. Um, and so this is one of the aspects of classical uh, analysis that I think is really, really important even now. Um, so even if you're using um, object orientation, you should kind of always think about um, what manual steps can you bake in um, that are kind of cost savings that will ultimately allow you uh, to stretch uh, time and money a little bit further um, if you need to. Um, so not necessarily everything has to be an automated process. So um, again, kind of uh, this is a little bit skewed to the old uh, kind of way of doing things. And so um, one of the uh, aspects that uh, system requirements during requirements gathering, um, that idea doesn't really even approach the subject of uh, acquiring the actual resources that you need to implement the system. And so once you have an idea of the actual data flow, you have an idea of the size of the system as a proxy for of how many uh, components there are, and you have an idea of how many data store files there are, so you understand how big the database is, you understand how many touch points there are between a user and a data manipulator, and so you can start asking yourself questions like, um, do I need a dedicated application server? Uh, can I host that thing in the cloud, or can I um, have maybe a very small server I'm in a closet somewhere? Um, does every employee that is using the system need a computer or are there specific people who are only doing manual tasks? Um, and uh, this last one, which is kind of a throwback, um, is do I need actually specialized uh, computer equipment to be built, right? So um, if you think about uh, prior to kind of very cheap general purpose computing, um, you might have dummy kiosks that you need to be created in order to do something like an ATM system or something like that. Um, and uh, while this is fairly outdated, you might also consider um, software engineering projects on things like integrated machines, right? So integrated circuits um, have specialized hardware, and uh, the more specialized you get, uh, in terms of software, potentially the more uh, specialized you're going to get in terms of hardware needs. Um, so even though this is slightly skewed uh, to an older style way of thinking, um, it still does have merit. Um, the, these are still considerations that we want to take into uh, account. <clears throat>
Um, and so in the kind of heyday of classical analysis, what we were doing is you we were building maybe gigantic government systems, you we were building maybe uh, laboratory uh, data management systems for national labs, um, and storage itself was not very cheap at all. Um, and so if you were trying to build a banking system or you were building the data management system for Sandia, um, you're obviously going to have to have gigabytes, if not hundreds or thousands of gigabytes of storage. Um, and you would kind of have to ask yourself, A, uh, where are you going to store it? Um, so is it going to be on site or are you going to have to um, outsource somehow to some other firm? Um, are you going to manage backups to yourself? Or are you going to outsource that? Um, how are you going to ensure that the, uh, the storage itself is fault tolerant? Um, so now uh, we have fairly uh, cheap access to things like uh, solid state drives. Um, we have uh, cloud hosted fault tolerant servers. Um, that was not necessarily always the case. Um, and as we'll see next week in the architecture discussion, uh, we still have to deal with this kind of thing. Um, there are just way more options now uh, than we had in uh, the 1960s or the 1970s when maybe this was like a really, really, really big deal. So um, some of the specific um, kind of tools and uh, methodologies uh, baked into classical analysis, one of them is entity relationship modeling. Um, so uh, this is still heavily used in object relational mapping, uh, ORM, which takes uh, sort of flat uh, relational database tables and then maps them to uh, class structures in object-oriented programming. Um, the idea here um, is you have uh, entities, so this is an author, this is a novel, and this is a reader. Um, so the relationships between authors and novels is a one-to-n or one-to-many relationship. So an author can write many books. Um, and a reader can have a one-to-many uh, relationship with novel because a reader can read many novels and can also own many novels. Um, and this is kind of a naive uh, entity relationship diagram because a novel can only have one author, um, but it has anybody who has um, owned a textbook before, um, you know that many textbooks have many authors. And so this could also be, um, be a many-to-many uh, -many relationship, potentially um, many novels to many authors. So this kind of gives a, a high-level overview um, of, of how we model relationships uh, which again is a large part um, of what systems analysis is all about. Um, you also have uh, ideas like finite state machines. Um, so while entity relationship models can tell you the relationship between specific um, objects for specific classes, um, what finite state machines do is they allow you to show how state changes um, after interactions. And so here, what we have um, is a safe that is locked. We have um, edges on a graph that tell you um, how uh, the state changes and the result of that state change. Um, and so finite state machines are very, very, very good at doing things like uh, modeling uh, elevator state. Uh, you can think of any number of things. Um, so this is more about the internal state of the entity than the entity's relationship with other entities. And so kind of to put um, classical analysis all together, uh, and if you and just step back a moment, um, there are a lot of different tools um, that are covered in chapter 12 in the textbook. Uh, I'm not going to cover them all here. Um, many of them are really, really esoteric. Um, and they don't get a whole lot of usage now. Um, if you're interested though, chapter 12 has a lot of information. It's one of the better ch uh, chapters in the book. Um, so you might want to take a look um, just to see if there's something in there that might be helpful for your uh, group project. So um, if you want to do classical analysis kind of top to bottom, um, the first thing you would want to do is you would want to draw out the da data flow diagram. And so again, um, this is the business process. This is not necessarily the system. Um, so you would want uh, somebody in the business team uh, to sit with somebody in the technical team and could sort of map out all the interactions that data goes through um, in order to get from a source to a store. Then what you want to do is prioritize all the components that need to be computerized. 
Um, so potentially all of them could be uh, computerized. And what you want to do is start with the absolutely most critical ones and then put uh, the ones that could be left manual at the very end. And so you can kind of think of this as a stretch goal situation. Um, ideally, if you meet all of your, uh, all of your goals, you would have everything uh, automated. Um, if you kind of stop somewhere in the middle, you still have enough automation um, that the system is worthwhile. Um, then what you want to do is you want to link specific requirements to components in your dial, uh, data flow diagram. And so uh, when we talk about uh, software engineering research, we're going to talk about uh, software traceability. And the idea of traceability is that um, every time you're generating a document, like a, a specifications document, or you're uh, generating requirements documents, you want to be able to trace um, why that requirement is important and how that requirement is being supported in the system. And so this linking between requirements and components um, tells you exactly which requirements are mapped to which part of the data flow. And any uh, requirements that are not linked to the data flow, um, A, should be um, maybe refined in some way, um, or um, they should be uh, identified as potentially uh, non-functional requirements that apply to the entire system or something like that. Um, they should be the exception, not necessarily the rule. Um, and then at the end, uh, you have to determine the physical and storage requirements. And so there is a huge uh, question. It's called buy versus build. Um, this is a component of uh, next week's uh, lectures. It's extremely hotly debated. Um, and so this is basically the first uh, foyer into that. Um, so we, we kind of have to understand um, the computational power that we're going to need in order to make the system work. Um, we're also going to need uh, to understand um, sort of the storage requirements that we're going to need uh, in order to put everything together. OK, so to reiterate. Uh, classical analysis, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and it will let you design systems that are gigantic. It will let you design systems that are really complicated. And it's still applicable um, even in 2020, right? There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with it just because it doesn't um, use uh, object-oriented ideas. What is wrong with it is that it doesn't use object-oriented ideas. Um, so. There are um, aspects to um, object-oriented design that makes analysis easier, um, particularly around vocabulary and uh, sort of uh, behavioral patterns for classes. And um, classical analysis doesn't actually leverage any of that. And so there are situations where uh, classical analysis can make things way harder than it, they need to be. Um, and so that's certainly a limitation, but it isn't necessarily an inherent a uh, flaw that's that's unrecoverable. So the alternative to classical analysis is um, object-oriented analysis that basically tries to take um, all of this kind of cognitive dissonance that exists naturally between the business team and the technical team and reduce that by making the technical specification and the business process um, as similar as physically possible. So um, like I was saying uh, a little bit earlier, in chapter 12, um, at toward the end, there are a ton of tools um, that are used for classical analysis, and a lot of them are really, really strange. And so my favorite example is uh, PetriNet. Um, and if you take a look at PetriNets and how PetriNets try to um, kind of visually represent uh, business processes in a way that is supposed to help um, like this sort of technical team, um, you will immediately recognize that uh, trying to apply something like object-oriented uh, design to analysis um, is way more natural um, than trying to get everybody to speak the language of petri nets. Um, so uh, this is kind of a uh, it's kind of a very good. Uh, just an example of how um, object-oriented analysis isn't necessarily uh, the end-all be-all, but in a lot of cases, it's a much more natural way uh, of kind of thinking about software analysis. Um, so instead of thinking about data um, and data flow, 
um, what object-oriented analysis uh, is based on is uh, object-oriented design. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to take the entire business process, you want to break that business process into as many different classes as physically possible, and you kind of want to have um, all of these uh, object-oriented ideas um, such as class uh, or uh, methods and uh, properties and all of that mirror um, the business process as much as possible. And so while uh, classical analysis has the data flow uh, diagram, um, object-oriented analysis has interaction diagrams, and those interaction diagrams effectively show you the call uh, graph of a method on a class in the system. Um, so it will show you that um, the user class can call the account class to create a new account or to modify an account or to deposit money into an account, so on and so forth. Um, and the ultimately the benefit um, of this kind of analysis is even a, um, a, a sort of business analyst, even a person who uh, just works at a bank and doesn't really have formal training in software engineering uh, can take a look at an interaction diagram and an interaction diagram makes uh, way more sense uh, to a generally educated person than a data flow diagram uh, in, in almost every case. Um, they are just a, a more natural representation of the, the situation. And so um, the, the three sort of primary um, types of classes um, in object-oriented analysis um, are entity classes, boundary classes, and control classes. Um, and this is how t the text kind of breaks up um, like the, uh, the composition of an object-oriented uh, system. And so um, basically an entity class is only good for holding long-term state. Um, and so if you think about an accounting class, um, this would be uh, a class that stores the account number, it, is st it stores the uh, person's uh, birth date and their first and their last name and their address and all that kind of stuff. Um, the point of this is that entity classes themselves typically do not have behavior. They, have, they traditionally really have state. Um, and behavior um, is on a different type of class. So boundary classes, um, they model the interaction between your product, um, so your actual system that you're trying to create, and the environment. Um, so this can be something like a reporting class that actually pulls uh, data out of a database that was stored by your classes, um, or uh, UI components that bind uh, to your uh, entity classes, uh, UI uh, elements like text boxes and buttons and all of that. Um, these could also be um, boundary classes with APIs. So you could be calling the, the Stripe API, or you'd be calling the Twitter API, um, and boundary classes would provide access from your program to someone else's program. And then uh, control classes are where all of the behavior is stored. Um, so we said that uh, entity classes uh, represent data, control classes represent logic. Um, and so control classes would take in um, the account, for example, with an account management class, and it would actually um, make modifications to the account management class, uh, updating the, uh, the total amount in the account, updating the person's name, so on and so forth, um, before it actually uh, performs a persistence uh, uh, action and updates uh, whatever that account uh, information is in the actual database or uh, on disk or wherever it's at. So um, note that this is not necessarily the same um, as uh, object-oriented programming as you are uh, accustomed to it, right? So in many cases, um, you have classes that have both behavior and data on the same class, um, and that is entirely reasonable. Um, this is just one way of trying to uh, split it up. And so uh, it's really important to remember that basically anything that you could do um, in object-oriented programming, you can do in object-oriented analysis. Um, this is one way of splitting things up. It's typically like an enterprise multi-tiered way of thinking about things. Um, you have service uh, classes that do all of the 
uh, all of the behavior, and those things tend to be uh, tend to lend themselves to things like RESTful APIs, where they don't actually have state, and then entity classes represent all of the state. Um, and so you don't have to have state on uh, manipulation classes because there are entity classes that take care of all of the storage for you. Um, that isn't to say that you couldn't do analysis with the sort of traditional multi uh, or uh, unilayered uh, object oriented design. Um, it would just be slightly different um, than the way that we uh, approach things here. And so, um, object oriented analysis is not without challenges. Um, so, just because this is a more modern way of thinking about analysis or thinking about how to put together a system doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end all be all. Um, and so the number one problem that you could run into uh, when trying to perform object oriented analysis is you actually step into uh, architecture too quickly. Um, so what you can end up with is a specifications document that is actually a technical specifications document that is more geared toward the technical team who will uh, go out and actually implement the system than it is the business team. If you think about what we were talking about at the very beginning of the lecture, um, what we really want is we want to translate seamlessly between the two teams. And so if you go too far down a technical path, then what you're trying, you're actually doing is you're making it harder and harder and harder for the business team to actually understand what's happening. And if they don't understand what's happening, they're not going to agree um, to the specification. And then everything has to go through many iterations to get it back on track. So um, one of the uh, very basic ways to make sure that you are not um, going too far to the, uh, to the technical side um, is to uh, make sure that you're answering the question what the uh, project is supposed to be doing and not how. Um, so there are ways that you can answer the how question uh, in software analysis, but the questions that you should be answering the how to are fairly superficial. Um, how, in terms of uh, technical uh, understanding or technical implementations, those things are really a technical consideration um, that are subject to non-functional requirements. So all the requirements in the requirements gathering phase have to be represented in the software specification. So you have to have all of the security and all the performance stuff. Um, but um, you do not necessarily have to uh, dictate in the software specification how you're going to meet um, all of those requirements. Um, that's something that is left to um, the architectural design. Um, and it's also uh, very, very important to remember that uh, analysis and software specifications, just like everything else in agile development, um, is really an iterative process. And so even if um, you have uh, come up with a software specification um, and uh, everybody is uh, on board, uh, you can still kind of make changes as long as you're clear about them. So at the end of the day, what you want uh, for, from your uh, software analysis is you want uh, some sort of specification that meets these three criteria. One, it is easy to understand and there is very little ambiguity such that the business team thinks that ABC is happening and the technical team actually uh, performs XYZ. Uh, that's not great. Um, B, it's not too technical. So if both of the teams can't read the specifications, they will not agree to the specifications. And if they don't agree to the specifications, the entire uh, exercise is worthless. Um, so it can't be too technical. And it also can't be so fuzzy that the uh, technical team doesn't even understand where to start. Um, but that is less common because the requirements gathering um, really happens on the business side. Um, like we were saying before at the beginning, um, the requirements are really on the business side um, of, the, of the diagram. And then third, um, the specification itself needs to be clear and easy to navigate. And I, I put easy to navigate instead of concise because there are a very, very in-depth uh, specifications that are easy to navigate. And if you go to MSDN or one of the, these kinds of uh, websites for Azure or for Google uh, Cloud, 
um, or for um, AWS, they have uh, dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of pages of uh, documentation for every service that they provide. And uh, these aren't concise pieces of documentation. They aren't concise specifications for what the service actually provides to the end user, but they are easy to navigate, right? So there are ways to provide links um, that actually take the person to the information that they actually need to see, um, all sorts of things like that. And so um, while the first bullet point is really saying that both teams have to agree to what uh, every requirement and what all the context means, um, the last bullet is saying that you should be able to go into the documentation and actually find something that you're looking for, um, and you should be able to find it only one time. And so there should not be any uh, sort of paradoxes in that specification um, that contradict each other, things like that. Um, and so you want a specification that is internally consistent, that is easy to understand, and that everybody uh, kind of gets some benefit out of. So um, the reason why these things are so important is ultimately um, these things become a binding contract between um, the client who expects services and the software vendor who is expected to provide those services. And so if you have ambiguity and you are contractually bound to provide an ambiguous service, then potentially the client can always come back and say, oh, well, we need those last hundred hours for free because you didn't uh, live up to your end of the bargain. Um, and that is not necessarily a place that you want to be. Um, so it is uh, to everyone's best interest uh, to make sure that ambiguity is minimized um, so that when you get to this binding agreement uh, process, um, you are much more comfortable. Everybody's kind of risk is covered um, from uh, misunderstandings at the actual specifications uh, level. And so ultimately, you also want to remember that everything is negotiable. So even after you have signed uh, that binding agreement, everybody's agreed on everything, um, you can still implement a, a, a change request process that allows you uh, to do three main things. One, auditing, which means that if a person changed something last year, um, and then today they're refusing to pay for it because they don't remember changing it last year, your change request process should allow you to audit that change and tell them exactly who and when um, that change was made. So who made it and when it was made. B, um, that change uh, uh, process should allow for matching a budget. Um, so if you um, have a client that says, hey, we suddenly want uh, to change um, this whole part of the system, um, that should trigger something somewhere that says, hey, um, we should go and talk to the business team about uh, procuring more funds or reducing some other uh, part of the system that now is going to become uh, nice to have rather than a requirement uh, in order to cover um, the budget that's going to be taken on by this additional work. Um, and then last, the uh, change process should also allow you to plan because the entire time things are changing, you should also be progressing through the phases of the project. Um, so if you have split the project into 10 pieces and you are going through the last four of them and you change three of them, um, you should have some process in the change process that says, hey, we need to maybe take a step back, do all the changes first, and then look at these last couple of uh, components or uh, maybe lockstep and do some of the components and some of the changes, um, but you should always plan um, so that you're not uh, just waking up one day and then you're four weeks behind. Um, the change request process itself should throw the flag and say, hey, if you want all of these changes, then potentially we're going to get run over by an ABC number of weeks, um, and then the client can plan accordingly. Um, the point is that this formal change process effectively allows you to attach a document to the specification document that says, 
um, yes, we originally agreed to these 10 things, but you changed three and then added four, and this is the paper that we agreed to for those changes. And so the actual specifications document itself becomes this sort of living document um, that you don't necessarily have to go all the way back to square one uh, to redevelop every time somebody makes a change. Um, and so this uh, specifications document becomes very agile in that um, the change requests themselves just basically become addendums. So you're just adding them to the end. Um, and so it's totally fine um, to continue to be agile even after the contract is signed, as long as you have some sort of formal process that, uh, that performs these three things um, that kind of mitigates your risk um, of taking on the additional work caused by the change. And so in conclusion of all of this, um, having a whole bunch of requirements is really just the starting point of trying to understand what your project is trying to do. Um, you can't go just from a giant heap of requirements to implementation, to testing, skipping analysis and skipping design, even though in a project assignment or a programming assignment, you very well might be able to do that. Um, these projects are typically large enough um, and they pull in enough budget um, that you really have to be kind of methodical about how you go from a giant stack of requirements to the actual code that you're implementing. Um, and so after you have uh, performed requirements gathering and you have used the metrics to understand that your requirements are not changing and the requirements are not being added to constantly, um, you kind of have to start looking at the relationships between those requirements in order to kickstart analysis. Um, so analysis is not just uh, prioritizing requirements, it is actually trying to see how you build a blueprint out of these bricks. Um, so how do I arrange things uh, in a cohesive way to actually perform the business process that the, the system is supposed to be performing. And um, the project specification is the first place where there is an actual formal agreement between the client um, and the software vendor. And so sometimes you will have uh, contractual obligations uh, for requirements gathering. Um, you'll have a statement of work or something that is there for scoping. Um, this, these are typically much more formal and they're much larger agreements um, because it's obviously a much larger uh, block of work to actually uh, build the piece of software than it is to uh, perform requirements gathering. And so um, the next step in this process is to actually take this uh, uh, specifications document and build an architectural document out of it. And so what we're going to do is take this uh, kind of blueprint that we have, uh, agreement between the two teams, and we're going to take that back to the technical team and we're going to apply software architecture to that design or to that uh, specification to develop a design that allows us to actually uh, start implementing software. And so um, architecture is the uh, place where um, we actually take the specifications and we tie specific technologies to that specification um, so that we can actually start uh, building code and testing code and delivering uh, pieces of the system. So um, that is um, software analysis in 57 minutes. Um, I recognize that this uh, video is uh, much choppier um, than some of the others. Uh, I apologize about that. My child is trying to escape halfway through the, uh, the presentation. Hopefully uh, this is not too disruptive. Um, I'll review the video and uh, I'll shoot another one if it's, uh, if it's too bad. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know. Um, again, this week is really about this one lecture um, and really starting to uh, hone in on what you wanna do with your uh, group projects. Um, so again, if you have questions, comments, concerns about the group projects, uh, please, please let me know early um, because the uh, proposals are due on Friday. So thank you very much for tuning in uh, and I will see you next time.